Hello everybody, this is Brian O'Haran. We're doing another program tonight, Getting Things Done. You see up there behind the credits a picture of a disgruntled lemon. As I go around the last few weeks, go around town, people comment to me, these Democrats in the majority are lemons. So tonight I've got a picture of the mayor lemon that I'll be showing a few times, I hope, on the program tonight. As I discuss various issues in the town. And in future, we'll use this lemon to represent majority of selectmen in this administration which ended just a week or so ago. My guest tonight, once again, I've had him on in the past. First of all, it's my friend from the University of Kansas, Charlie Tidwell who at the time that I knew him, the late 50s, early 60s, was the fastest man alive. Charlie won five national titles and set four world records as a member of the great Kansas two-time NCAA track and field champions when I was there. Charlie won the NCAA 100 yard dash title in 1959 and 1960. He was also a hurdler along with Wilt Chamberlain and other people. He won his first title and world record in 1958 in the 220 yard hurdles and the 200 yard dash. Charlie was from the Midwest. I think he was from Missouri as I remember. Somewhere in that area. And a hero in his hometown. Charlie was proud of his accomplishments and fame. I just hate to let all these people down in any way, Charlie was quoted as saying. I once asked Charlie if he had any advice for me. And he said, yes, in my view, the secret to success is getting off of the starting blocks faster than the other runners and then sustaining your pace to the end. Charlie's no longer with us. He passed away many years ago while I was still at the university. He died very young. I hope that Gilbert and the Town of Winchester Board of Education understand those words and that advice that Charlie gave to me. Because we're going to have a lot of trouble getting this Gilbert, 7th and 8th grade, up to Gilbert by 1 September of 2010, as agreed between Gilbert and the Board of Education. We had a lot of trouble. I watched the meeting last night of the Board of Education. It was terrible. There was no sign in that meeting last night at the Board of Education that everybody's getting along wonderfully as a team. There are those in favor of getting 7th and 8th grade up to Gilbert by September 1 of 2010. And there are still those against it on the Board of Education, it appears. And they're going to make it as hard as possible 
for this effort to be a success. I think that's the wrong attitude. I think that both Gilbert and the Board of Education should get off the blocks very rapidly, now that they have agreed. Get moving fast, and then sustain their pace until they get across the finish line. And they too should be proud to work together for their accomplishments. Once somebody makes a decision, the Board of Education and Gilbert, then everybody, whether they like it or not, should pull together to make it happen. Doesn't seem likely. I think one way or another, Gilbert is gonna have to drag this team over the finish line, I'm sorry to say. I have three other guests tonight. One is a dove, because I'll be talking a bit about the exit of the town manager recently. After 10 months in office, as town manager for the town of Winchester. The lemon, which I've already shown you, which, which represents to me the mayor, that's her, and two of the other re uh, Democrats on the Board of Selectmen. And then there'll be a strawberry, because I think that one of the Democrats may be a strawberry. Seems to get along better with a minority. Seems to involve in the major efforts to get revenue into town and to help manage expenses in town and to help encourage things like the move of seventh and eighth grade to Gilbert. For the agenda tonight, I'll mention a bit about the town manager. Not too much. He's history now. He's done help with us out a lot. We are now without a town manager. And will be for a while. I'll be talking a lot about Gilbert tonight. Trying to pass on some information to you that I believe will be benefits of this move of the 7th and 8th grade up to Gilbert. And then I want to talk a bit about the town financial mess. Talk more about that in a few weeks in my fourth quarterly review, financial review, which will be dismal this year. As promised, the latest town manager, Wayne Dove, has resigned. Those who cared to listen to Wayne, and he did not speak in public for long periods of time, he was more of a poet with his comments, sharp, to the point, usually on target, and not to micromanage him, will miss his advice and leadership under very difficult circumstances while he was here. He was instrumental in helping selectmen for CASO to get the school merger off the ground and running. They were off of the blocks fast and kept up the momentum until the decision was finally made about a week or so ago to move 7th and 8th grade up to Gilbert next year. He also helped Selectman Fracasso lead the effort 
to have the town charter changed to allow the town finance director access to the Board of Education financial information subject, uh, subject to selectmen and Board of Education approval, which is yet to come. I heard some discussion about that at the Board of Education meeting last night. The strawberry was there talking to the Board of Education uh, members during public comment. There were some comments made <laughs> by the board, but I think in the longer run, this is a great step forward for our town. A big step forward for the town and the education system. This question about the financial director having access to the information was posed as an additional, as an addition by Selectman Fricasso and an early Charter Revision Commission meeting. You remember at the beginning of the Charter Revision Commission, the first pre-meetings and during the meeting, they were mainly interested in getting the restriction removed from the Charter that the town manager must live in the town of Winchester, which was also on the ballot a few weeks ago. But Selectman Fricasso went to the meeting and he brought that issue up about the financial director having access to the information, which I'm sure the town manager also agreed with. And they did include that in the questions on the ballot a few weeks ago, and it did pass. So we owe a bit to the town manager for that, and we owe a bit to the Republicans and uh, Selectman Fricasso especially for that. Now I want to say, people do ask me on the street, why do you keep mentioning these Republicans? They're in the minority. The Lemons are in the majority. And I say, well, because they're doing most of the driving here. They're pushing to get the cost down by integrating the school systems and all the overhead associated with it for the town. And they're pushing to try to get some revenue in, not as fast as I'd like to see them push. But you'll hear them at the select meeting, it's usually Selectman for Caso bring up various issues about getting revenue into this town. I would personally like to see it on the agenda every meeting for number one. What are we doing to get revenue into this town? So anyway, we'll have to settle for what we got and keep asking. Somebody made a remark to my wife last week when she went to uh, the doctor's office that your husband is very persistent. He doesn't give up. I don't think they use exactly those words, but that was basically the intent. And I am persistent. And I don't give up. Because that's how I was successful throughout my life. And that's why good things have happened to me along the way. And I don't think we, the town, should give up now. We have to keep going, even though we didn't get out the development because Mayor Lemon was leading a charge against it at the time and slowing its pro progress down. Now we have to find other ways to get the revenue in. And they're much tougher. There's nobody banging on our door to come here and give us a lot of additional profitable recurring revenue for our fund balance to help balance it in the future. Talk a bit about more in the quarterly review about that where I will read you part of my green papers again and go through the distribution of that money that was proposed. A campaign promise of the Republicans, I don't remember any campaign promises of the Democratic Party except We'll try to get along with everybody and get along together, which doesn't seem to be happening. Couldn't even, in my opinion, couldn't even get along with the new town manager that they unanimously helped to hire. So a campaign promise of the Republicans and the chairman of the Board of Education and her supporters within the Democratic Party, and she did not have the whole party supporting her, 
is progressing. Thanks to the tenacity of Selectman Fracasso, with some help from the implosion over the last year, implosion financially of K through eight. They ran over budget by almost one way or another 360,000 or so dollars, which we still not have found. We're still waiting uh, for some decisions there. They're running behind on this year's budget by about 150,000 or 75,000, maybe more. They're having a lot of trouble. They just lost their fifth finance director since I been back in town. This one lasted a few months, was part-time, and is gone. So we're having a real problem in there, and we really need a lot of help from town personnel, Gilbert personnel, and K-8 personnel that are still left to try to get a handle on this situation and try to integrate things so that everybody uses the same computer system. We perhaps have one superintendent for the whole system, one purchasing department for the whole system, one financial system for the whole system, one computer system for the whole system, perhaps even building maintenance for the whole system. There's a lot of things that have to be addressed here, as the town manager pointed out before he left, that will be very beneficial for us, including, perhaps, the elimination of one of the buildings that the town owns for the K-8 system. A joint decision was has been made, I reported this if you watched last week at the end, I tacked it on my repeat program. A joint decision has been made by the Board of Education and the Gilbert School Board to move 7th and 8th grades from Pearson to Gilbert. As you know, Pearson has kind of a reputation as a building for not being up to date, and for having structural problems and things like that that need quite a bit of money. They put in, the uh, Board of Education put in to the five-year capital plan about $10 million for each of the three schools, so that's $30 million. So if we move them to Gilbert, they're in much better shape up there structurally. I'll talk a bit about that tonight. And if they move them up there for the 2010-2011 school year, That'll help, but that is subject to certain conditions. They've already been agreed, but I just want to bring them to your attention once more. Gilbert must rescind a $288,000 charge that it made to K-8 through for not producing enough students. Um, as they had promised in one particular year. I'm not sure exactly the details there. So Gilbert's agreed to that, to rescind that money, that request for that money from K through eight. Well, that's a help. That's 288,000 that the uh, K through eight won't have to go find. Another one was the Gilbert and Board of Education agree to a three-year contract yet to be negotiated. Right now it's a one-year contract and we're already partially into that year. Gilbert wanted a 10-year contract for a lot of obvious reasons. It takes a long time in education to change things. Always remember that when you were in kindergarten, if you were, I wasn't, there was no kindergarten when I was young, but first grade, it took 12 years to get to 12th grade. Didn't do it in one or two or three years. So things have to mature, and it takes time to change these kind of systems. We'll talk a bit about that tonight as well. So they're going to sit down and try to negotiate a three-year contract. I'll be beginning that negotiation uh, 
pretty soon, which I think is good. You never want to wait till towards the end of a contract, as I've said on this program many times, to negotiate the next one. You're probably better off a year or two in advance because it takes almost a year just to negotiate the contract. Unless you have some real intelligent negotiators and executives on both sides of the aisle. And remember, once contracts are signed and everybody approves them, then it's best to put them in the bottom drawer somewhere and get on and do the right thing, both parties. Can't be sitting down arguing about the contract all the time. That's one of the reasons I don't like to see lawyers too much involved in the day-to-day, week-to-week, and month-to-month efforts once the contract's signed. Unless serious problems come up. And even then, the executives should try to solve these problems. Stay away from the lawyers as much as possible. Last night, there was an argument at the Board of Education where they're trying to stick lawyers onto these, in these areas. I particularly think that's a bad idea. They should be involved, but we don't need them as members of the team. Gilbert agrees to a joint financial committee with the Board of Education. That's great, because there are a lot of issues between the Board of Education and Gilbert that need to be resolved and they need to be resolved and managed on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and year-to-year basis. They're all on the same team, and they have to make it work together. It's a symbiotic relationship. They're all trying to do the best for the town, for the employees, teachers, and administrators and all, and for the children, of course. There has to be a balance. They have to run efficiently. They can't waste money. And they have to be professional. There are a lot of this right now. A lot of people worried about this. Those issues should be put to bed as soon as possible. Get off the blocks and put those issues to bed so that people don't lose a lot of sleep, perhaps their health, worrying about where they're going to be on September 1 of 2010, or even if they're going to have a job or not. The next one was Gilbert agrees to appoint a full-time joint curriculum coordinator. We're going to talk a bit about that, I hope, tonight. That's great. Because we have a test score problem throughout our school systems. And unless we get together, Gilbert and K through eight, next year K through six, and work with a joint curriculum coordinator, we won't solve this problem. And even if we do work together, it'll take years to solve this problem. It's not gonna happen overnight. Okay, now, what are some of the advantages of moving 7th and 8th grade to Gilbert? That decision has been taken. We're not here to argue that decision. We're here to explain the advantages. According to the uh, uh, executives, and town manager included, we'll probably save an estimated 561000 to 700000 in recurring cost saving to Gilbert. The jury's still out a bit on the K through eight cost savings. And the K through eight superintendent doesn't necessarily agree with these cost savings. Both the town manager and the Gilbert superintendent think that they're gonna save more than that. I tend to agree with them. but they have not got agreement for that from the K through eight superintendent. And perhaps one of the advantages will be that one K through eight school building can be closed or used by the town for other purposes. Now there are some problems with this. 
one of the problems and difficulties, I'm not saying it can't be surmounted, is that when you borrow, when you get grants from the state to fix up buildings, repair buildings, etc., then you're supposed to keep them in use for education purposes for the next five years. We have one building that I'm pretty sure is not in that category, and that's Bachelor. They had a kitchen there, but I think that was done more than five years ago. But I'm not an expert in this area, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not a state finance man. And you know, usually when you get about in the state and the feds, there's all kinds of strings attached and loose ends, and so that's all gotta be worked out to see if that's even practical for the next year or two, may or may not be. The next is perhaps greater sa savings for K through eight. There are people who figure we can save more there. Part of it's eliminating a building and all the maintenance on that building and some of the uh, other things involved there. Utilities, heat, all that, electricity, maintenance, repair. structural problems. So that has to be looked into. And it won't be easy. Because in my opinion, there has been pushback from people that are not in favor of moving 7th and 8th grade to Gilbert. They'll try to find any reason they can to stop this project. And we don't want that to happen. We all got to move forward and get it done. It's pretty hard to move forward when you're always trying to get everything to go backward. You saw the Board of Education meeting last night. It was a pretty bad situation. Now let's talk a bit about Gilbert. The test scores I already mentioned. We don't know for sure about this, but Gilbert may be able to align the curricula for grades 7 through 10 and provide appropriate remedial services. Now, there have been rumors in the past, I'm not saying they're all true, but that Gilbert would, would, would blame K through 8 for not having children prepared for entrance at, at a, the proper level into Gilbert. Well, that problem is going to be gone sooner or later because Gilbert is now in charge of 7th and 8th grade, so they'll have to blame themselves if the 8th graders aren't prepared for ninth grade. But the next question arises about K through 6. Because the 6th graders must be prepared for 7th grade when they go to Gilbert. And that's why this joint curricula, curriculum coordinator between K-8 through and Gilbert and the Board of Education is so important. Because they all have to work together with the curriculum coordinator to make a smooth transition and get the test scores up throughout the system, not just in one grade or the other. So anyway, these uh, two steps we mentioned here may help to boost the test scores, but it will take time. And I use the word may because you're never certain about any of this stuff. For all we know, they may raise the requirements on the test scores just when we think we've got things under control. We do have mandates, you know, in the system, and this is... Uh, is uh, part of the problems we have. It could also be a benefit too. But the more churning you have, the tougher it is to meet the... can't keep changing the target all the time and expect people to make it. Gilbert will be able to work with K-6 through six via the curriculum coordinator to align the K-6 through six and 7-12 through 12 curricula. The alignment may also help the Connecticut Mastery test scores, which we talked a lot about, especially the Republicans and Kathy O'Brien when they were running for office, 
that something must be done here in this area. So, maybe Gilbert, working with the K through 8, the Board of Education, the curriculum coordinator that's just been hired, can help solve this problem. We gotta give it a chance, we gotta work together. It will take several years, of course, to achieve significant gains in the test scores. The new K-8 Director of Special Education appears to be open to cooperation with Gilbert. We have a new one. I'm not sure we have the curriculum coordinator yet, the overall one. I might, uh, maybe I said the wrong thing there, uh, but we're going to get one because that's part of the agreement that Gilbert and the Board of Education made to move seventh and eighth grade. So, but we do have a new K through eight director of special education who's on board, has had some meetings with Gilbert, and appears to be open to cooperation with Gilbert. Now, of course, she doesn't really have much of a choice. <laughs> We gotta work together. That's part of our job. We gotta be successful. It does no good for one side to win and the other side to lose. Doesn't make any sense. The hope is that they can combine in a special effort, Gilbert, K through six, when it becomes K through six, Board of Education and the town and whoever else they need to bring back, over time, the special education students. This has been a big issue in this whole process of making this decision. That are currently in very expensive placements in specialized schools. So it's their hope that maybe we can get those people back from the specialized school and take care of them ourselves in our own school system. Let's hope that we are in a new era of cooperation between the town and Gilbert. Now when I say this, I don't mean a lemon type. We're all gonna get along together. We're all gonna cooperate. We're gonna work together. I mean a real, let's cooperate, let's work together. Let's talk about the real issues, let's get them on the table, let's everybody know what they are and then let's put a plan together to solve them. Let's not say one thing and mean the other. Let's not say one thing and do the other. Let's get this job done in a real spirit of cooperation. Let's show the town what a real spirit of cooperation is not a political agenda, spirit of cooperation that doesn't come true. It is believed that Gilbert's facilities, facilities on the Gilbert campus, will remain structurally adequate. They are, they're structurally adequate now with a few exceptions. It is believed that Gilbert's facilities will remain structurally adequate for a long time to come. That means we won't have to put in 50 million to rebuild Gilbert over the next 10 years. You don't have to worry about that. A renovation in the year 2000 was addressed. Has addressed significant issues for the physical plant. They already been addressed. The year 2000 and whatever time frame it took in that period. Now there are, of course, there are some, despite the maintenance being done every year reasonably, there are some short-term structural issues that will be addressed. They're known. Gilbert knows what they are and they plan to address them, such as boiler replacements, which happen happens in your own home once in a while. 
some chimney repair, which happens. If you have a chimney, you know that. And questionable retaining wall up there we've been hearing about over the years. I'm not up to date on all that facts on that, but they're aware of it. They know they have to do some work there, but they don't have to rebuild the whole building and find another piece of property and blah, blah, blah. So we're in pretty good shape. There's a lot of space there. That'll be part of what they have to work out for the seventh and eighth grade move and to get in the, the other children, bring the other children back from the special schools. It all has to be worked out between the schools that we exist in our town. The Gilbert School Corporation, as I'm told, has a building and grounds committee that meets and reviews, I got that spell wrong, but reviews reports on a bi-monthly basis. Gilbert has approximately 100 acres, I'm told, upon which structures could possibly be built. Say we wanted to add another school up there for K through 6, or two buildings for K through 6, or add another building for any growth in Gilbert. If it happens, doesn't you know? It's not going in that direction, but you never know. So they could possibly be built despite the difficult terrain that exists up there. So, you know, when I was living in, in San Diego for 10 years with my company out there, I was a mountain there one day and uh, 6,000 houses uh, a few years later. They took away the mountain. So maybe they can do something in that uh, an area up there and the difficult terrain parts of it, and maybe they can't. That's something that yet has yet to be determined, but there is the possibility there. And we are a town that does lack space for this kind of thing. So this is a gift. And if we do have space, it entails cleaning up contaminated property, purchasing a lot of expensive property, cleaning it up, that kind of thing. And a lot of businesses say they don't want to come to our town because they don't want to go through two to five years of cleaning up some property. They want to go to somewhere where they can build their building in the next year or two and get on with life, get on with their business. Now we're going to talk a bit about the town financial mess. And for this one, I'd like, if you're there, Dave, to put up the lemon for this one. <laughs> a lot of it will be on the board here, but the town financial mess, because I believe that the lemons aren't helping us in this area. They're hurting us. For example, in the last few meetings, I could only stomach about five or ten minutes of each of them, but it's always, well, we'll put aside working on the long-term plan, because we're waiting for the new town manager to come to town, so he can participate, or she, participate in this. I'm not sure any women are in the running, but uh, if they are, that's good. Or, well, let's put that aside for now, until we get the new town manager into town. So it seems like we're not getting on with business of any import until we have a new town manager. Now let me tell you, the new town manager is not going to get up to speed. It's going to take a while to get here, get to know everybody. He's going to have to make nice for quite a while until he understands our situation. So, you know, you probably got six months of a year before he'll really be effective. So what you got to do is you got to get on with the seven selectmen finance board and the existing commissions and management of the town and you got to keep moving. You got to move as fast as you can. You don't want to hold up anything. But Mayor Lemon likes to hold up everything. And take one more look, or 10 more looks, or 20 more looks, before making any decisions. We often talk on this program about 
pulling up the uh, roots on plants all the time to see how they're growing. In effect, retarding the growth of the plants. And that's what Mayor Lemon likes to do, retard growth, in my opinion. And that of a lot of other people in town as well. And it's becoming noticeable now because we're in trouble. And all the retardation that has been caused by the mayor and her team over the last five years is now becoming very, very apparent to people who need the additional profitable recurring tax revenue that has been stymied over the last five or six years. So the town financial mess. Yikes. I say yikes. I don't know if people still say yikes, but we always said yikes. So expenses. That's part of the financial mess. Expenses. Guess what? They're increasing. They're increasing despite the problems we have in the nation, the state, and the town. Can you believe that? Somebody's going to have to pay for the $400,000 that was over in the education and town budget. Most of it in the education budget. The town budget actually was in pretty good shape last year, but it has to absorb things. We don't have a very, we only got 400000 or so in the fund balance. We should have $1.5 so we can't absorb much there. We got the school board overrunning now with no plan to uh, break even uh, for, the, for this year. So you probably add another three, four hundred thousand, maybe up to six hundred thousand there. And you got one point six million or so given to us by the feds and the states over the last couple of years. Some of most of that probably won't be given again next year. Some may, some may not. But it does look too bright. So the expenses for fiscal nine ten. Board of Education was overspent roughly by 400,000 or a half mil. 800,000 is a mil. Now, 800 plus some change. We're awaiting final results from the auditors due shortly before we really know. Uh, we're pretty sure the finance director has the information now from the Board of Education that they requested from the Freedom of Information Act. And you know, he's pretty sure. I did talk to him. He says, it's going to be somewhere in that neighborhood unless the, re you know, the auditors show up, more or less. So, when we get those final results, then we'll know where we stand. And that'll be in a select meeting once we get them. And, as I said, the fund balance is about $400,000. Now, for fiscal 10, 2010-2011, uh, the Board of Education is overspent in the first quarter by about $175,000. I was watching a meeting the other night where I said, you know, it's still being overspent again this quarter. So if they overspend by the same amount this quarter, that'll be already up to $350,000 overspent. And if that continues for the year, you're going to be up to $700,000 overspent. Now, I don't expect that to happen. One way or another, the Board of Education and the uh, superintendents have to get this thing under control, which they don't seem to be able to do. A lot of excuses, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of speeches, a lot of everything, a lot of blame, but no results. The same rate of overspend may be continuing in the second quarter, as I said, and perhaps the third and fourth. Let's hope not, but I see no signs I want to see some facts before I say anything differently. And then, as I mentioned, the 1,600,000 or so has been advanced to the Board of Education by the state and federal governments to help us get through this recession over the last two years. It remains to be seen what will be coming next year, but we know everybody's in trouble. You just went through the elections, you know what's happened there. P 
people are trying to re-emphasize spending wisely and cutting taxes and encouraging job creation in small businesses rather than in government. If the health bill goes through, eventually, I forget, I think I heard the number, 16,000 people would be added to the IRS. And I can tell you, it's not cheap to add people to the IRS when you consider their health care and their retirement packages. I'm not saying they're any worse than anybody else, but that's a lot of people, 16,000. So we're all, everybody's in a pickle here, not just us. We're not the only ones that have to hunker down. We're not the only ones that have to pull together as a team, solve our problems. Can't rely on a state, can't rely on the federal government. We gotta do it here. Can't wait for the POCD. I heard this week that the POCD has been, you know, the government's given us another year to finish the POCD. Of course, I don't believe we need to finish the POCD to get the additional recurring um, profitable tax revenue into the grant list. We should be able to do it other ways. And we have to do it other ways. We can't sit around waiting for the POCD and we can't sit around waiting for the big development that was going to make us, uh, uh, put us in pretty good shape. We have to schlag and do it the hard way. Bit by bit. All together. So, we got that 1,600,000 uh, that we're going to have to find a way to lump that if we don't get more money from the state or the feds. And I'm pretty sure we're not going to get 1.6 million. We'll get something maybe. They always f manage to winkle something out one way or the other. But that money may not be available in the near future. Maybe they'll give us some next year, a little less the following year, but sooner or later we're going to be out of it. We've got to get going here. We've got to get off the blocks and run fast, like Charlie Tidwell would say, and get some additional profitable recurring tax revenue to help us balance the budget in our town and get a lot of these albatrosses we have around our neck around town off our neck off our back. Now we also have put forward this year a five-year capital plan. Now capital plans haven't meant much around here in the past because we never met them. We never, a capital plan is basically a revenue plan. What do you need? How much money do you need to clean up the streets, to do this, to do that, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't have anything about where you're going to get the money from doesn't have any expense side to it. Therefore, it always turns out as a, a not a very implementable plan. But they're working on that now. They're trying to figure out what they need, how can they prioritize it, what can they get done, how can they fund it, without killing the taxpayer. Because remember, in our town, we're going to average 4% a year, maybe a little more, or maybe a little less, in taxes on the existing taxpayers every year for the next 10 years or so if the past is any indication of the future. Then people will say, well, Torrington averages five or five and a half. And I say, yeah, well, Torrington has a fire department that's paid. They don't have a volunteer fire department with 150 or more volunteers working with minimal equipment in old buildings. Now, I'm sure that's not the only reason, but it's a pretty expensive reason. When I talk to people in Torrington, that's the answer they always give me. You've know, you got to understand the fire department. Nothing wrong with it. My uncle was a fireman down there, died on the line of duty. I'm not knocking firemen. I'm just saying that's a difference between Torrington and a difference between Torrington and Winstead when it comes to taxes. Now, revenue. Well, guess what? Do you think that's increasing? Of course not. It's not increasing. It's been going down for the last couple of years. 
because there's a lot less building going on. There are less applications for permits. There's less applications and things in the uh, town clerk's office. We're not getting as much money from the state. We're not getting as much money from the federal government. And remember, I'm interested in recurring money, not a one-off gift from the state or a one-off gift from the federal government. We need to build up recurring revenue that we get every year and that increases every year and that's profitable enough. Not all of it will be profitable, of course not. Somebody mentioned this to Mayor Lemon in a few meetings back. He says, well, of course, all the uh, revenue won't be profitable. Well, we all know that. You can't stop people from coming to town with children. You want children in the town. That's good for the town. But you need to realize that it's just as important to have the profitable revenue that you get from industry, some development projects, 55 and over, and businesses that pay a lot, like Homer D. Bronson or whatever, in personal property taxes that are very profitable to the town. Shopping center is in that category. So when you get more of that, and you can't say to me, well, we can't get more than that because we're the draggy town and we're, we've got such a bad reputation, which by the way comes from most of our own people by writing letters to the newspaper and stuff like that, and blogs and that kind of thing. We, we bring that upon ourselves. And when I went to the t summit meeting three years ago, three years ago, the business leaders that were there said to our town leaders, and a lot of them were there, that they wanted us to get rid of our image, get a better image, and they wanted us to improve, be more business friendly in attracting businesses and working with businesses, the executives in our town and on our commissions. So that's very important. But now, I would not take that as an excuse. My view is, despite that, we've got to go get people that will come to town. And I wanted to mention that there's one place down on... Uh, and i just speculating a bit here, but there's one place down on Route 8 that wants to add a building or two, a business. There's another place that's already added one and may want to add another one. We may not like the business they're in, and we may like the business they're in. But beggars can't be choosers. We can't sit here and say we want a champagne manufacturer to come to town. When no champagne manager, put man, uh, manufacturers want to come to our town. We've got to get in there and get the people into town that will come and will help us build our town successfully and balance our financial position. So revenue, it's decreasing. So guess what? Costs increasing. Revenue decreasing. And right now what we need are costs to decrease and revenue to increase. Just the opposite of what's happening. Until we get to a balance point where we can afford, and I'll talk about this on my quarter review in a few weeks, which I'll repeat a few times. I'll give you some examples of where we could spend any increase in additional profitable recurring tax revenue. There's plenty of places here in town well, that will benefit from that. I outlined them in my green paper. So we're getting towards the end of the program. 
you can put up Charlie Tidwell's picture again, I'd appreciate it, Dave, because I want people to know that Charlie was the fastest man in the world. Because he worked hard, he trained. He had the ability. He was not a negative thinker, he was a positive thinker. He was proud of his accomplishments in a time when it was difficult for an African American. He didn't want to let anybody down. He wanted everybody to be proud of him, including his school, his family, his town, the America, and the world. Now, if you put up the picture of Mayor Lemon, we have a totally different situation in our town. We're not proud of our town. People will say nice things about it, but we're basically not proud of it. We don't go out and sell it. We have a lot of adverse circumstances, but our leadership, this administration and the one two administrations ago, have tried to retard the town. Not to make it better. To make it into something that they think is utopia and nirvana. When most of the people in town don't agree with them. And it's, I think probably it's because, despite all our attempts to educate them, the educators don't want to be educated. Nor, perhaps the same with the townspeople. Somebody asked me the other day, an elder uh, citizen who has a business, uh, Brian, what do you think of all this? And I told him. And he said, well, we've known that all along. So we got to get our act together here, and we got to vote these people out next time, and get back people who are interested in balancing our budget as soon as practical, and not putting off things until we get a new town manager. We don't have a town manager, we don't have a town planner, we don't have a, a financial controller for a, a K through eight. We got two superintendents leaving at the end of this school year, Gilbert and, and uh, K through eight. We got all kinds of situations here where we are not staffed up. And that's partly because we're under severe pressures now to work half time. Some people don't like that, so they leave. A lot of pressure on the teachers, a lot of pressure on the townspeople. So let's do something about it. Watch these select meetings, see for yourself if you can stand them. With that, I say good night. Thank you very much.